Welcome back to Escaping Gilead. This is for the finale of the fifth season, the 10th episode. This one is called Safe. This is Paul. This is Caroline. Who the hell is safe at the end of this whole thing? Some are, some aren't. Some kind of seem like they are, but most of them seem like they're not. Yeah, nobody's safe. Wasn't that tricky what I just said? I was like, some are, some are, but most people don't seem. (laughs) I think no one's safe. I think safety is a construct here that I do not think that most of these these individuals are, are going to feel. Even the ones that are not incarcerated or on the lam or... Or currently have like a face mask tied on their face uh they are only temporarily safe probably so i agree let's jump off this little cliff here with janine and lydia because june and nick and all the biz that happens over in canada is definitely going to be where we need to end up but i want to talk about what's going on in gilead in last week's podcast we had talked about needing to get some amount of closure with the Lydia, Janine, possibly Esther storyline. I think when I said that we just need to touch on it, just a touch would be enough. Bruce might have taken me too seriously because all we did was just touch on Janine. Yes, some something major happened, but the but the cliffhanger there, I wonder where it's going to go. I feel like the actual theme or the uh, episode name could have been like snapped not safe because I feel like every single person who is in this cliffhanger position is actually there because they snapped. Mm. And I, I want to figure out like where, where could Janine possibly land? Where could Lydia possibly land? I want to talk this one through. So as you guys know, we have Janine and Lydia having this really actually wonderful rapport with one another, right? I mean, we know that Lydia has this like really motherly like feel with Janine. Janine is getting along with being this sort of mentor type teacher to the other handmade people. There's something about that for her that gives her some amount of happiness i guess you know like she's singing the annie song and and they're doing everything they're doing i know it's chores and i know it's like scrubbing floors and stuff like that but she seems actually calm and like kind of okay it's predictable there's a routine you're Mm -hmm. not in a ceremony right you're not giving birth you're not Not having children taken away from you right so this is this is as good as it gets as a handmaid right it kind of is yeah The Code Brown thing made me laugh when they were singing. (laughs) But I liked Lydia's attitude when she came in and she was like, let's sing something a little bit more appropriate. But like, I don't mind you guys singing while you work. Like, it's okay. And contrast that to a scene that took place in the same hall where she's, you know, cattle prodding someone for not scrubbing a stain that will never come out and that was put there a hundred years ago. Exactly. And she knows that. But she still feels like she needs to do that. But this is a new Lydia. The problem for Janine, I think, is for us to get the the Lydia that will start the the testaments. I I think Janine will end up being the sacrifice that the show Mm. demands to make Lydia come around. Lydia realizes that this is not actually a safe place for Janine because everyone is watching, everyone's paying attention, seeing that she's getting some sort of preferential treatment. So she comes up with this plan to have her placed with Commander Lawrence and Naomi. This would be a great way she can see Angela. Chances are Lawrence is going to be like real busy and like maybe no ceremonies or anything's even going to be going on because he's never really been like a pusher for that. Do you remember how much he didn't want to do that like in earlier seasons? Oh, yeah. So in that case, this is a pretty good situation, right? On the surface, yes. I mean, her own kid is in that posting. Yeah, Lawrence won't be that demanding of her. It's just the personal situation there with Mrs. Putnam, Naomi, the current Mrs. Lawrence. I guess we're all changing names today. I mean, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? That's right? complicated, right? We right. have to we have to be like, everyone's got a new name. No need to freak out. Naomi was really harsh with this situation. Having Angela be sent away to the grandparents all summer and making her like have this trial kind of setting. I mean, I thought that was all really like just turning the screws on Janine because she didn't want to be there. She said, I do not want a posting. 
this was exciting to get to possibly see your daughter and then have that part taken away right away. And then, of course, the worst, Naomi pulls a total Serena and acts like we're friends, right? Oh, this will be so great. See a familiar face of Joseph. <laughs> oh, my God. My head exploded. I was like, no. We haven't been in that in that headspace with a handmaid in such a long time. It, it felt like, are we still doing that? <laughs> you know? We are still doing that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, the last time we saw it was between Serena and June when she sent the little letter off red. It was so offensive then, you mm -hmm. know? And so now, I mean, my God, Janine, I understand why her brain just exploded, right? Like this is the snapped portion of it all. And she has the same speech ready that June had for Serena. Like, we're not friends. We're not cool here. Don't try to be my friend. And just wigs out. So are we to just jump to Naomi told Lawrence, she mouthed off to me, and Lawrence was like, well, whatever, get rid of her? Yeah. Okay. I thought it was very creative of them to have the rumor going on in the house where you have, like, the Martha come over and be like, hey, listen, June got hurt. And layer that part in for Janine to like kind of like bring her back to earth, you know, because she's been living this Gilead life and she can kind of stay in her bubble until she hears this news that June is hurt. That like brings her back to like, what what are we trying to do here? What's going on? Where's real life? You know, to have that happen and then be called of Joseph right after that was like, oh, my God, like, how could you possibly keep it together? And then what are they going to use that picture for? They're going to have like this handmaid in it that they that they, that they had on staff for like one day and a Martha that they got rid of on that same day. So it's like, uh, we're going to need to take a new picture, of it, I guess. <laughs> I don't, I don't think, think Joseph cared about that picture at all. We might have understood that Naomi complained to Joseph that the handmaid mouthed off to her and she wanted her gone. And, jo and Lawrence, Joseph Lawrence, was like, okay, fine, whatever. But with the Martha being in the takeaway van at the same time, mm -hmm. and them two having shared, not treasonous, but something, some something related. I mean, uh, the rumor about something going on in Canada at their level with June does seem... Yeah, they're not supposed to be talking. They're not supposed to be talking about and that. And they shouldn't right. be getting any information. Like, what kind of line of information does this woman have from Canada? So my question mark is, is does Janine getting pulled away have not much to do with mouthing off to Naomi as it does spreading rumors with the Martha? Oh, shit i mean i don't know if it matters i mean are you trying to separate that as if like did is lawrence gonna kill janine because she talked back to his wife yeah which one is it because the martha had nothing to do with that but the martha's still in the takeaway van i don't know i guess i didn't like try to tease that out like which one was it like why does it make a difference to you i guess it's shades of dark gray okay. in terms of just how far off the deep end uh lawrence dove into the I'm the head dick in charge now, you know, because okay. if it's if he's cleaning house just for spreading these kinds of rumors with. A, wait, wait, wait. A, you can't say just for. A, no, hold on a minute. If someone has information from Canada. Yeah. Then they are not spreading rumors like just talking shit. They have contact with the outside world. That is absolutely forbidden. Joseph Lawrence has sent people to Canada before multiple times. He sent Emily. He he helped with Angel Flight. I mean, he he's been complicit with getting what he what did he call it? Women that don't fit the Gileadian model away rather than rather than kill them. But in this case, there's rumors going on in his house, so he so he has them taken away. It's 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 indicative of of a, of a new level for for me if that's the case. Like either he's needing to present himself as someone that takes this kind of stuff seriously and has to sacrifice these women along the way, or he really does believe that he has to squash this kind of thing because he's a true believer now for some reason. Yeah, you caught me off guard with this entire conversation. I was not like, I, I wasn't ready to kind of like dissect Lawrence's current loyalty. I mean, I guess I get you. Yes, over time he has let other people go, but... 
I think he is wanting things to be pretty strict at this point. I mean, he's willing to offer things like New Bethlehem to offer like some breathing room, but I don't think he's okay with people on his staff having contact with Canadians. That's a whole different thing than Joseph himself choosing to put someone across the border. That is his choice. I don't think he was ever okay with that type of thing. Do you think? Or do you think it's the Naomi portion of like, he has to have a traditional household? That's the push right now. And so you can't well, have like any kind of deviation like that? I think N- Naomi's part of the solution to needing the traditional looking household. Like like multiple yeah, Marthas but, and the giant staff and right. it's all lit up and all that kind of thing. Right. His house was always so dark and it was just like him and Eleanor. And like one, like the cook yeah. or something, yeah. And he's bringing on Naomi almost like a staff member because he needs to present better. Well, maybe he also needs to appear a little more hard na- more hard, strict. hard line in order to um, appear in front of like Mackenzie and stuff as hard as he needs to. Like, like with say later, we're going to talk about yeah. Nick. Nick. This and- is yeah. I mean, it's certainly going to fall apart. I mean, because of everything with Nick, I think is just a mess. I mean, this is a good question. I I wasn't. My focus really wasn't on Lawrence. My my focus was really about how Janine had been like kind of in this brainwashed space and Lydia as well. And then through a series of events of like being reminded of their place in this world and then being reminded about the outside world of someone like June, then just watching how quickly the brainwashing of it all just like cracks, you know, and immediately Janine is back to the Janine of day one who got her eye plucked out. Like she doesn't care about the consequences of this. She was still smiling. She was, she walked up the stairs smiling after she yelled at Naomi. So, I mean, my focus was totally on the effect of these women and like what happened to all of them. So you bring up a good question. It's not something that I was really focused on about what Lawrence's actual role was here but i think that that does lead us easily into nick and figuring out like well what is his role having to do with what nick is accusing him of and what happens there but right before we go there let's finish out this conversation with janine and lydia because lydia having to actually chase down the eyes when they come to take janine and watching her get pushed down to the ground it was breaking my heart and it was also kind of like making me shake my head because she kept calling out janine's name as if janine could change what was happening like she wasn't calling to the eyes or saying something like you know i don't know something more official sounding but she was calling to janine like janine could just stop this whole crazy situation you know well, she was completely just out of control of it. And, and she's almost never out of control of what's going right. on around her. And she her. kept trying to point that out. She was like, I'm in charge of these girls. Like, they are my responsibility. You can't just come in here and snatch one and not even tell me what's going on or where you're taking her. And you can't treat her this way and all the different things. It was clear that we're setting Lydia up to feel completely betrayed by Gilead, by all the commanders, by all the things that are happening she is feeling consistently over the course of this season betrayed. Like every time she turns around, she's like, I dedicated my life to the rules you set forward and now you're mocking them. You know, you're laughing at the ceremony. You're laughing at the idea of handmaids being treated respectfully. All the things that she works for, for the entire series up to this point is just becoming, you know, like a joke basically. And finally here she is with someone she really cares about in Janine and just getting pushed down to the ground like she's nothing. No respect for her. I mean, that was jarring to see them be so harsh to Lydia. Like, supposedly one of their own, you know? Exactly. Yeah. The performance that Ann Dowd gives in this episode, you know, it's reminiscent of the early days of the show when she was on more episodes consistently. This mm-hmm. ep- this season and most recent seasons, she's been in maybe half, you know, give or take, because yeah. they haven't needed Even to less, be. Even less, really. Yeah. You know, like in the scene where, say, she is standing off to the side and just hoping and hoping and hoping that Janine won't shit the bed with Naomi when she's trying to talk her way back into the house and and Ann Dowd is having to just like kind of bite her tongue and, and not and she sink or swim she has to let janine say what she's gonna say but she's and doubt is doing it all with her face Mm -hmm. and elizabeth moss who directed this episode had the camera on and pretty close Mm -hmm. um so we could get all of the nuances of what she was doing with her face and and uh i i i really liked the performance i i thought it was uh 
really great. And and you got the whole range of it. You got like the hopeful aspect of her maternal instinct with Janine in that sequence. And then you, what you just described is kind of the frustration and the, and the ultimately kind of broken heart with her futility and, and what she's dedicated her life to and how she can't even affect that anymore. Their relationship was a little bit of hope. Like you said, there was like a crack, you know, in the system in a way that made you feel like, I don't know, Janine remains some sort of little ray of sunshine through that crack, you know, like, like having them sing a little song or like do whatever, like made it seem less insane somehow to have that little ray of sunshine be carted off with a mask on their face. They are definitely setting Lydia up for the testaments. You know, we definitely can see where that's going to come in. Do you want to talk about the fact that there was no Esther? I kind of think Esther's story's done. Oh, you do? Given that how be so weird. You know, in a in a weird way, I know that we talked about it offline a little bit, how the various extra cast members such as Moira and Rita had their story curtailed for non story reasons, if that makes sense. Well explain it. It was an interview with Bruce Miller. The reason is that their story was intertwined with Alexis Bladell's character Emily. And when Alexis left for personal reasons, their story didn't didn't stitch well back with the rest of the story. So rather than fake it or some other thing, they had to drop that storyline and, and do something else. And so we wound up with stories that were very much focused on just these main few characters with the other characters just sort of dropping in here and there. If that kind of moves forward, I would see where like the Esther's I don't know why we would hear from them again, you know? Mm, I think we've put in too much time with Esther and the way that we left her screaming in the bed and everything. I don't see, I see her in season six. Okay. They would have to give some explanations somewhere, whether it's in an interview outside of the story or within the story, like Esther died or something. But we've spent so long with her. I mean, she was in the previous entire season with everything with the farm and all that. But I mean, how are, we, how are you just walking away? Maybe closure, but I don't think she's like going to be like an episode in, episode out kind of character. You don't think so? You don't think that she carries over to the Testaments in any way? No. Wow. Okay. Well, that's really like going to be kind of a bummer for Esther's storyline. <laughs> I think she's a great actress, and I think that she's brought a ton to the Gilead side of the stories because we had we didn't have that much. So if you take away the the Esther role of the you know poisoning them and and everything that happened with that, I mean she's she has been like a rabble rouser, you know, she has been the one who's been doing stuff in Gilead. So if you lose her and Janine is masked somewhere, like we have nobody, that's yeah. going to be awfully hard. Well, How do we do that? Like I mentioned in the last podcast, like the fact that, that there is a testament, the fact that that is a thing means that the, the end of this series is not happy, is not hopeful in that, in that way that you would have hoped in the, Watching see episode one, season one, where you're like, boy, this is a shitty thing. I wish I wish our characters were happy and this goes away, you know, and that's not going to happen at the end of The Handmaid's Tale. Right. It just can't. It definitely creates this real like um, block in my brain about, again, what is a satisfying ending for this series? Because it's supposed to be like running into the next series and so in that way, you don't have that natural bookend because we're not, they don't want to bookend the story. They need it to be able to flow to the next one. But that makes for a whole lot of characters not necessarily being given a satisfying ending for all of us. Now, if you've read the book, which I'm not going to go into at all because this is the finale. And if you haven't read it, go read it. You'll have some, you'll have a whole year. We have discussed the whole time of what is satisfying is hannah being back with june but gilead continuing to to, to reign the world is that good enough you know is that okay by us or does gilead have to fall as as a nation is that what we have to see like unclear what anyone would consider like a victory in this scenario right does america have to come back or like what are we looking for as a win um, I really hope as season six comes forward, I really hope that there's something that is like gives us a little bit of like a 
like a path to get on so that we feel like we have a sense of what would be a successful end to the series because we have spent so much time with these characters to just have them kind of slow trombone out of our lives feels like wow we've really invested a lot of time in all of them i don't want them to just wander away which a little bit feels like what happens, say, like with Moira and Rita. And I understand the the practical side of it where Alexis Bledel wasn't there to play Emily. So their storyline kind of just got, like I said, slow trombone kind of out of the picture. There's maybe nothing you can do about that. But it worries me a little bit as an audience member because we cared about Moira and Rita. I wanted to know where their story was going to go and what was going to happen to just have them sidelined for reasons outside of everyone's control feels like, oh. What will happen then? You mm -hmm. know, what's the what's the bar are we setting for like, again, success for these for for an, for an ending? All fair. And I'm sure we'll talk about it more next season and probably more this episode. But I'm just telling everyone listening to this. Brace yourself for not having a series ender that wraps itself up in a nice, happy you know, let everybody buy a, a Coke kind of ending. Mm, okay. Let's talk about Nick because I definitely feel like he is a Gilead resident who is not going to get to buy a Coke at the end of <laughs> his time. As they say in Caddyshack, no Coke for you. No Coke for him. I'm afraid. <laughs> then so, you don't get no Coke. That's what he says. You don't get no Coke. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to get into everything that happens with June. And obviously everything that happens with June is the catalyst for Nick really losing it and confronting Lawrence. Were you shocked at, first of all, the first time he confronts Lawrence? Yes. And yelling at him that it, that June isn't a target. I thought visually they did a really beautiful job of kind of doing those aerial shots where you were seeing all the black suits. They've done tricks like that before and it's, it's always, cool. it's always, yeah, it's always cool. Kind of like a, uh, like a Nautilus shell type, you know, or spiral design, mm -hmm. just the, the this perspective in the stairway it's, it's always a cool effect there's something about that that the two things came to mind one i mean i think as a finale it's always fun and cool to put any visuals that call back to anything else definitely we've seen some aerial shots with like handmaids yes. remember when they were doing different formations and stuff outside remember they were doing their circle stuff they're doing different things it's like a marching band. They're like doing like a big H. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, <laughs> but but yeah. also there was something about it that made me feel like hive mindy or like ants, like in a colony. There was something about the way they were moving and there was like layers to it. It was very hive feeling. Like if it if there was a sound, it would be a hum, you know, that was coming mm. out of there, you know? Yeah. Which, I mean, speaks to the whole like, you know how this country's being run. So we have Nick confront Lawrence. Shocking that he does this in front of people. Shocking that he outwardly is like, June's not a target. Nick, my man. Right, like a little privacy for this convo might have might have helped. Remember when I said that June did that like, <gasps> when they didn't kiss? Yes. I think Nick did that. I think he went to the car and went like, <gasps> and like, like had to like do like, like, like blow on his like face with his hand and stuff. Because I feel like he was like, I mean, he has turned a corner. He is suddenly way more in love with her. Oh, yeah. Willing to yeah. act on it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the past season and a half where they've been separated or even before that, he's always had like a little line in the sand where he wouldn't go beyond. He just told her at the <gasps> moment, he said, I have a family. I have an unborn child. Like I have people I need to protect. I mean, he was very, very clear that this is as far as I can go. Please tell Nicole, love her, all that good stuff. Now, the only thing that I can think of that maybe got under his skin was that last line that June says to him about how daughters look up to their dads, kids look up to their dads, all that kind of biz, right? Yeah. I'm not saying that exactly right, you guys, paraphrase, but that's the thing. That's the only thing I can think that shot into his brain and like <laughs> fermented for a while. He has, he has a real change of how far he's willing to go and how public he's willing to be in Gilead in support of June. He does lose a little bit, doesn't he? He loses it all the way, Paul. <laughs> I mean, this first discussion with Lawrence, okay. And, you know, I think Lawrence is right when he's like, if you're going to start a fight, everyone's going to get bloody. Everyone, everyone, everyone is going to get bloody. Cool. I got that. Very, very right. When Nick goes to actually want to see June in the hospital, I was like, oh, 
this guy has got it bad, Paul. He's like all this talk about like, oh, I need to be here for Rose and Rose is so important. Uh -uh. And I know everyone who's listening is like, like, Nick's loved June the whole time. What are y'all talking about? Yes, but he wasn't willing to walk away from his job in Gilead. No. Yeah. He didn't take the deal with Mark before. Like something has changed, you know? Mm -hmm. Something went like, what? When they like met each other again, okay? So then after he actually agrees to meet up with Mark, were you shocked about that? Like now he's willing to work with him? Yeah, well, that scene, again... A lot of the the shots in this episode were staged in a in a way that the camera follows a person going along some kind of corridor, some sort of path, in a in a way that builds tension. Right? We have heard other comparisons of this episode's direction style, which Elizabeth Moss is responsible for, to that of like a horror movie. And I agree. Uh, and his shot crossing the that bridge was one of those th kinds of things a slow reveal yes okay so we've seen this bridge before this is where they swapped friedrich last season right that was the last time i think we saw this bridge right why you call him friedrich like that you're gonna confuse everyone fred waterford the, but the camera pulls away kind of like in front of him so we don't see if he's just defecting if well, what's happening here or you could have thought june or some or luke or somebody well, no, else june was tied up right then no 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 but <laughs> <laughs> yes, obviously. But Luke or you're right, Moira, I don't know, somebody could have been there, but it's Mark and he's willing to work with Mark now though. Big freaking change, right? Yes. Big change. Now, of course, it's easy to say he saw June, you know, after being hit by a truck and her arm smashed to smithereens. You know, that would change anyone's heart, right? In terms of feeling like the, she needs she's not protected enough. She needs me. She needs more protection. Or also, Gilead's lost their mind, and they're, like, going after people in other countries with this, like, hit intent. That's not what I'm here for either, you know, as Nick. So, I don't know. I mean, I guess we can obviously see that things got ratcheted up across the board, but I'm just so surprised. I mean, I got to say, let's just get right to it. When Nick walks in in front of all of the other commanders and, like, punches Lawrence. He just sort of Will smith him. He just, he just gave him a good... He, like, clocked him. However, you I don't know if it's open-palmed or closed fist or whatever. That was, like, his death sentence, right? How do you come back from that? And he was willfully saying out loud, like, like this is about June. Like, no yeah. one there was confused why he was hitting Lawrence. Well, and Mackenzie has been saying... Yes. ...that we need to get rid of June, and Mackenzie was standing right behind Lawrence. And Lawrence just, we just discussed it a minute ago, sent members of his household to probably the wall. I'm guessing. For possibly just appearances sake. Why wouldn't he have to turn the tables, even though, you know, it was Nick who, who helped save his ass right. last season. Now it's Lawrence having to send Nick to the gulag. I think that the line of the entire show comes when Rose comes to visit Nick and Nick is trying to express what went on here. And she says, a good man doesn't leave his pregnant wife every time his girlfriend calls. Were we ever confusing oh my God. Nick with a good man, though? Not me, but I mean, I guess... Well, every man wants to think of himself as a good man. Do they? But as, or like a man with their reasons is how I feel like it. Well, Nick is a man with his reasons for right, sure. Right, but that's not necessarily a good man. Yeah, but I'm talking about every, you're, you're always the hero of your own movie, right? Absolutely. But Nick, to us, as people watching his movie, mm -hmm. has always shown that he is someone that's going to do what's best for Nick. You know, and try. I mean, I think he's tried to hang in here to yeah. figure out his way. Fair. Although, here's the deal, you guys. We have no no moments where we've ever pulled the curtain back on Commander Blaine, head of the front line. I don't know what he's doing with those soldiers, and I don't know what kind of torture he's inflicting on these areas that he's supposed to be in charge of attacking. Good man? Question mark. Like, I don't know. How is he being so victorious in all of these things unless he's out there either shooting people himself or telling people to shoot people? Them? Yeah. He's been a difficult character, I think, across the board because he does have boundaries. And this is where I'm, I'm kind of saying like, boy, what pushed this boundary 
so hard so fast. It's got to be when we get into talking about June and just the insanity of what went on with her, right? Well, maybe he thought the last time June was brought up by Mackenzie, it, Lawrence just was sort of like, mm, whatever, it, it's worth considering. Maybe he thought he was in on that conversation. And so for things to change with June, the memorial gunfire was the initial thing that got him going. And then the truck, obviously, later. That might be part of it, not entirely, but maybe part of it, just that he was left out of that that shift, whatever that was, that bought, that he eventually got Lawrence to basically admit, where Lawrence hemmed and hawed originally by the time Nick had punched him and run out of the room, <laughs> or not, right. was dragged out of the dragged room. Dragged out of the room. Lawrence was saying what? It was, it was something to the effect of uh, someone else made that decision, it wasn't me. I, I, I think that the leaving out is a really good point. I think that him having been a part of what he felt was Lawrence's inner circle gave him sort of the ability to kind of turn a blind eye to some things that were going on. But the second that thing, bad things were happening and he was out of the loop, then now, yeah, he's like outraged, right? So yes, it is partially for the love of June and Nicole and what could be possibly going on in Canada. But I agree with you. And I think this is good. We had this like discussion. I hope as as the audience, I hope you guys are hearing like we're teasing this out too. like we're just walking it through and being like, OK, hang on a second. So I agree with you that the him feeling pushed out of the circle of the circle of trust, if you will, not being told all of the information is definitely fueling his like ego flames right now. Well, right. If you're, if you're Nick and you're thinking that you can rationalize your lot in life by saying, well, as long as I'm in this position, I can take care of the person I love and the daughter I love, right? But then that is <laughs> revealed to be a big fat lie that you've been telling yourself that you really had no justification to tell yourself in the first place, then yeah, yeah, it changes things. I feel like the anger too would be justified because he's... <sighs> He has been the right hand man. I mean, he's been told he's going to be like the governor of New Bethlehem. And so to feel like suddenly you're being outside the loop, like, wouldn't you just feel like your position just slipping through your fingers? Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like that you're right, that that's where a lot of the outrage is coming from. Like, why aren't we working on other projects? And why didn't I know about this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, let's talk about the big old June in the room, because... <laughs> <laughs> we can't possibly discuss this finale without really, really going in depth into June. The original of Joseph. Uh, well, not really. There was well, one a, of. <laughs> there was of Joseph's before. But let's get into this opening sequence, which 100% I thought we were in a dream. I thought we were in a dream for so long. What you're seeing may may have been uh, partly resulting from the shooting style, that horror movie, surreal. A lot of things. The garden having turned into like a grave. Well, she you know? screwed it up. I mean, she like pulled it all out last, yeah, last yeah. week. But, but it was like it had like a border and stuff, a part of it. Like it was all gone. It was just this rectangle looked like a grave. And she was kneeling beside yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all of that. Then the truck pulls up and it says red on the side of it. Like very red center, very handmaids. And this package arrives and it's a bulletproof vest. Every single moment of this felt like we were in some wild dream in her brain. Even just sitting on the on the window seat with the sun coming through, that was so reminiscent of her doing the same when she was a handmaid. And then her actually having the conversation to Willow and the truck following her and everything. Like, like all of it seemed like, in real life, why aren't you walking on the sidewalk? And then you have the surreal business of like every single household seems to be packing moving trucks yeah like it all seemed very nightmare well and that 360 camera weirdness move. yeah we're all of a sudden like yeah that that never had happened in an episode that i can think of not very often if it did maybe in like a stoning scene or something they did that all of it seemed completely dreamlike to me then when the truck actually hit her i was like what the fuck is <laughs> happening and then, you guys, when the truck ran over her arm, I was like, I don't even know what I'm watching. Like, I felt like her arm would have, like, like just been ripped off, like, from, like, her elbow down. Like, seems like it would just be shattered in a million pieces. Well, those those big, muddy, mudding tires are, are somewhat squishy when they go over <laughs> things. 
<laughs> you know? Okay. Because to me, I'm just like, I don't see why your bones... I think it would still be several hundred pounds. Yeah. I'm just thinking your hand stays there on the sidewalk and like you're not you're not able to pick it up or move it or anything, you know? Like it, it seems like it would be barely attached. Yeah, well, I mean, to see her later maneuvering that that stroller everything with, with both she arms. just has like a sling and whatever mm -hmm. i mean this would have required surgery that to dog me. don't hunt it looked awful like you said the horror movie part of it obviously her actually being hit by the truck and then it running over her arm that all felt very like jump scare the jason slash michael myers or whatever is chasing you and you're running in the middle of the road i and think that you know how that shot when she's underneath the truck and you just see the intense like half of her face that's so like looking under the bed kind of thing too i, where I think she's that's hiding. like the cover of of the invisible man the movie she was in oh, i think that's i think that's the, the covers like half of her face is, is yeah it's, it's crazy that's crazy yeah. yeah so so much going on with all that i i mean what did you feel like did did you figure out right away no this is all totally real even luke running out and like beating the shit out of that man seemed like to the point where that man dies we find out is like all of that felt like that couldn't really be happening i also thought maybe we were in the middle of some weird dream thing up until the arm situation you know it just like this is not a show that has that many of those kinds of sequences i did shift over to if they're showing it to us on the finale like this i think i think it's all happening it did. It did happen. I'm not yeah, confused no, no, no. at this point. Uh, clearly, but uh, we're talking about midstream, like, like was, while we're watching it. Yeah, but yeah. While you were watching it, you already had convinced yourself, no, this is real. Yeah. Really? Like from at what point? Like did I said, when the when the arm got run over. Mm, barf. That was so gross. <laughs> so gross. Okay. That's the first masculine thing we've seen Luke do. I mean, that's not entirely true. He did try to do some stuff. The whole Jaden business. I mean, he's like, oh, I'm going and blah blah blah. I don't know. I mean beating a man to death come on now no that was nuts that's why i thought i wasn't watching reality i was like how could this be happening anyhow we do see that sticker on the bumper that gives us the gilead clue that this guy is at least a gilead sympathizer if not straight on a hit from gilead we're not sure but one of the two things it's really quick that this starts to unfold with rita's extra information that the guy has actually died and that they're coming for Luke. Like, this is it. And and June's going to be questioned. Everything's going to be questioned. What did you think about the need to run at that point? Remembering back to the early seasons of Boston. I think I reached that conclusion about a minute before June did. They were foreigners and things were adding up to a lot of resentment toward foreigners in that in that country right then. And so they would be better off not being found. After our experience as the audience, watching them, especially Luke, downplay everything the whole time in Boston and watching that whole thing, like we were kind of joking of being like, so what? You can just put your money in my account if you don't have an account. Like that kind of stuff where everything was just downplayed over and over again. It was refreshing that it took a lot less time and it only took really a couple sentences annoying that it even took a couple sentences though when june literally has had her arm run over and been hit by a truck for luke to say canada's not killian or any of that kind of crap was like i'm sorry did my arm was <laughs> run over like are you actually trying to be like let's not overreact right. like i just got literally run over by a truck like no dude I, I mean, did you feel like he should have just agreed quicker or was it like, no, that was warranted? I mean, that was a pretty quick agreement for, in terms of Luke's normal process. I mean, he, he had was... already said, why don't we go to Europe or something like that? Yeah. So yeah. why are we even at, why, why don't we have go bags packed? Well, I mean, do you have a go bag packed right now? Case... None of your beeswax. <laughs> like I'm going to tell your... We're your, not going together? Your male ass. Well, I don't know who's going to turn on me. I can't tell everyone where all my things are. <laughs> Just kidding. No, but obviously, if you're a refugee and you've had to run from America and then you had to run from Gilead, I think it'd be pretty normal to have a go backpack. All right. All right. I'm just saying something. I don't know what you keep in there. Probably some little toy of hannah's or some crap in there that you're like gonna like hang on to for the rest of your life i thought they ran out with very little 
is kind of my point. Like Rita? Just like a diaper bag. Handing over the diaper bag? Like, that's just your day-to-day diaper bag. It didn't seem like June had anything for herself, though, really. That's meant to get you through, like, a a trip out that day. Right, just to the park, the zoo, whatnot. (laughs) Exactly. So... I'm super glad that they left. I I mean, obviously, when we have Tuello show up, tell them they can't go to the airport. And then Luke says, I'm just going to try it at the airport anyway. You you were like, what? Uh, (laughs) It's like Luke doesn't pay attention. I don't know what is up with him. He definitely, I mean, that part was like, I mean, I feel like every single person in the shot, like their heads went like, like Scooby-Doo at him. Like, what are you talking about? You're just going to go what? You're just going to go to the airport anyway? So this whole plan is laid out now. Now this part, Paul, I do have some major questions. While I understand that June was run over and I understand that there's been a shooting at a memorial and I get it that those two things are very upsetting for the Luke June household. I was quite surprised to see the mass exodus of all of these people running to the train station. Is it that everything is just sort of coinciding? June's street running over and Canada's overall distaste for refugees has just come to a head all at the same time? On the same night at the same train station, I guess. I mean, we saw them all packing their bags, all those people with the moving trucks and all of them packing boxes. Yeah. And so clearly people were getting in trucks and people were leaving. I mean, well, I, we were... I've watched every single episode. I was quite surprised to see six moving trucks on their street. That their neighborhood might be mostly refugees. Right. Because the other day when there was all those demonstrations happening in the neighborhood that were, they were honking horns and riding on the sidewalk and stuff like that, it seems unlikely that their house would have been pinpointed as much as just it's just well known in yeah. that that's just the neighborhood where the Americans live. Seeing all the moving trucks. I mean, it was shocking. I guess it's not that it's unlikely or that it was unreasonable or irrational. It was just shocking to see it happen so fast. So maybe that's enough. Maybe that's enough as the audience member to just say like, oh my God, like it went from like that neighborhood was totally normal. She was like, went and got apples like a couple of days ago and all this stuff was normal. And then now people are like, fleeing like crazy down into the train station tunnels that was fast and furious for this maybe perhaps former americans had it happen once and they were like we know what it smells like (laughs) when things are going rotten and so it's time to go and no one wants to wait to the last minute as what happened last time so i a thousand percent agree i was i'm like i'm saying as the audience though I was lulled into a sense of safety in Canada. Ah. And so what I'm saying is that while the participants in the show responded quickly and got the hell out, I was like, whoa, they're running fast to get out of here. And you're right. They have all the reasons in the world. I was over here being completely faked out by the Canadians, you know, got complacent reputation yeah. yeah, of being like kind and accepting and everything. And I'm over here like, wow, I don't know. Would I run that fast? What would I do if I was Moira and Rita? Why am I not packing bags? Why am I not running away too? like, why are we? Why? Yeah, I don't think we're supposed to poke I that. Get that. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that we run away. We get to the train station. All of that scene. Oh my gosh. I was having such Emily flashbacks with her little guy and her wife when they were in the airport Yeah, and they were realizing what was happening and they were starting to get like turned away and things were happening. Oh my gosh. All those people coming down the stairways, the escalators, the, the congestion, the panic. It was crazy. Yeah. Like I was having a lot of PTSD from the early, early on season. It, the staging of it and all that exactly reminded me of those same scenes or Schindler's List even. A thousand percent. A lot of people are comparing this to to getting on the trains um, for the Jewish people and, and everything. Now that brings up a big question mark. They're being told they're being taken to safety. Are they? Historically, that's not what happens. My belief is that this show is not moving to Hawaii. It's just not happening. So you think there's no way that train gets to Hawaii. My question mark is, was that train ever going to Alaska? Or is this train always going to some sort of internment camp or some sort of something? They have to get them out of Toronto, but do they have to get them out of 
Canada. Okay, so I've thrown out many theories that are wrong this season. So here's my newest one. Okay. This train is going to get far enough west so that when whatever happens happens and the train stops, June is going to get a really wild hair because she's now like straight north of Colorado Springs. Mm -hmm. And that Hannah meter is going to start wigging out again. Even though that is going to be the most un, like hard to traverse terrain in <laughs> North America because it's all mountainous, uh, she's still going to want to do it. I agree with you wholeheartedly that this train doesn't make it. My query, because I think that's a foregone conclusion, my query is, does Mark Tuello know he's not sending them to Hawaii? Like, is there a pre-set up camp somewhere no way Tuello is sending americans to a camp on purpose you don't think no way someone higher than him might have told him to do that but i think i think that guy's acting in good faith see i just think this is a silly plan we're gonna take you on a train all the way to vancouver and then we're gonna take you to alaska and then we're gonna get you to hawaii like it just you could probably stay in alaska if you want I don't think the train has anything to do with Alaska. I think, I mean, I, I think it's fair to think if they make it to Winnipeg, Saskatoon, we said, right? Yep. That's it. Like, I don't see it going much further than that. And I agree with you that that somehow we know that Nick had something going on in Chicago, right? Mm-hmm. That, that was like a contested area. At that point. So, I don't know. I, I I agree with you. I think that the train just gets you out of Toronto, but it doesn't get you. Not this train. And I don't see them in Hawaii or Alaska. No, me neither. I mean, I just don't think they make it there. Mm-mm. So, sad and scary, but man, okay, let's talk about this actual train scene, however. We've got Luke, who is realizing real quick that um, people have pictures of him He's feeling like, you know, everyone's looking and figuring out who he is and if he stays with June. Now, my question is, was he always going to get them just so far and then kind of create a distraction by turning himself in to let June and the baby get on the train? Was was that always his plan or did he just figure that out as they went? I mean, that's that's poetic to think that way. Romantic. But I mean, I think he wanted to get on the train. That was plan A, was to definitely get on the train. But once he saw the cops and and they started saying his name and showing his picture, I mean, he he did the math real quick. Now, when you have two people who have gone through as much as these two have, and you have them on their cell phones, and you have June say, come find me, and they exchange their I love yous, and they hang up, I don't know, like most of the time, that would get me like crying. That That would get me in my heart. It didn't. And I wonder how you felt about it. But you get what I mean, right? Like there's something interesting about the fact that these are two people who have gone through like hell, right? For now five years, we've been watching all this, more than five years in real time, but like five seasons. And and they're saying goodbye to one another. And and you're feeling like, oh my God, they're getting separated again. Like there's something about this where I, it, it didn't get me to my core. I can't tell you why. Except for, is it because I feel like Nick actually sacrificed himself more (laughs) in June's name? And so maybe I'm a little like, "Mm, that was, you did do something, Luke, you did. And you did get her on the train. But why didn't I cry for your relationship getting busted just then? I mean, you met, you admitted a couple weeks ago that even though there was the uh, physical romantic rekindling of, of Luke and and June's relationship that that it still pales next to the sparks that fly whenever Nick and June just even get in the same six feet of each other. So maybe it's just you like Nick better. Was your heart like ripped out of your chest? Because when we saw them getting torn apart from one another in the woods, that was a traumatic situation. And this should have felt awful. And instead, it kind of felt like, I wonder where what's going to happen with June and the baby. Yeah. Well, maybe it's like Nick is facing a firing squad, right? Or a something. I hangman's noose. Whereas, as far as we know it, Luke is going to get some form of due process. 
They kept saying over and over, though, when they find out you killed a Canadian in Canada, they're just going to like, like as if he was absolutely getting the death penalty. And I was like, I feel like when they lay out the case. Me too. And she was hit by a car and then run over. And then her husband punched the guy excessively. And then he ended up dying. I don't, I mean, what? You stopped a person wielding a deadly weapon. I mean, exactly. Uh, when are you supposed to stop? Exactly, exactly. So I, I don't know why they were making it be like, Luke, you're definitely going to get, you know, be executed for this. Right. Because so, it was a Canadian. So that was maybe it. Maybe it was more like, damn it, this is inconvenient. <laughs> you know? <laughs> okay, so maybe we, we just didn't. Okay, so I'm going with the idea that the stakes of Luke in the justice system don't actually feel like it's going to be that awful. Yeah. Like he's going to have to tell his story. He's going to have to explain what happened after that. I mean, I just don't see him getting executed. Like I just don't see that (laughs) happening. No. So maybe that's why I'm not, I'm not hurt so bad that the fact that they were separated. So now we have June on the train, right? She hears a little baby. Again, you know, my brain is so messy, like despite the fact that we know there's a fertility crisis going on in the world, the fact that she was like seeking out where that other baby is crying didn't really occur to me. How many babies could there be? And, you know, that kind of thing. Like I was truly shocked when we got to the end of her path and we have big smiling Serena and Noah. Well, last podcast, you and I had said, or at least I had said that I needed to know, I needed to know where Serena wound up once she got into the blue haired woman's car. But it's not unusual for an episode to just drop a character that was in the previous episode to advance the story of other main characters. And so I guess I was kind of used to that idea and subconsciously did, wasn't even asking, where's Serena? Where's Serena? Right. Where's Serena? Right. So, yeah. But, I mean, once she, she didn't show up at June's, didn't we kind of know she's going to show up at Mark's? I mean, I 1,000% assume Mark put her on that train with a fake name and a fake whatever. All the fake paperwork he gave to June and Luke. That makes sense. It has to be. Right. Because how else would she get on there? How else she would she? She needed all the paperwork, same as everybody she's else. She's wearing new clothes. So, you have these two staring at each other, right? And you got the whole, you got a diaper, which every mom in the room was like, that's not going to work for you. You got like a baby newborn and she's got like a two year old. Like, how's this working out? But, but, but the eyebrow back and forth between them, the raised eyebrow of like, are we really going to do this, Oscar? And it's like, yeah, we are, Felix. Like, <laughs> this is actually happening. Like, the frenemies are finally bonded together with no one else to turn to. They're the only ones that appears to have kids on that train. This is what is going to be happening together. You know, wherever this train takes them, which we do not believe in one second is going to be Hawaii. <laughs> and I don't think it's even going to be Alaska. I don't, I don't, I don't think we go anywhere near. I just don't see that happening for like you said, for just filming purposes and stuff. No, like no. we're not going, we're not doing any of that. And plus June doesn't want to go further away from Hannah. Like, I could see her going further west, like we said, to be more directly north from Colorado Springs. But after that, it could even be a situation where they're, they're, they have to take some sort of train stop or something, some sort of town pit stop kind of thing, you know, sure. for people to get food and go to the bathroom and do whatever. I don't know. Um, something. We have all these people squashed on this train. Some people might just run away at that point, you know, and decide to try to stay somewhere else. Maybe it's not as bad in Western Canada as it is in the urban center of t- Toronto. There, it's certainly not as populated as people think. Now, I don't know. I mean, it's very countryside out there. A thousand percent. So who knows? Who knows? And maybe things are going to be offered to them in season six. Maybe it'll be like, if you want to stay, we are offering like these homestead fronts or whatever. You know what I mean? Like that kind of biz. Like, sure. like you would think like old wild west. Like if you want to stay here, you can. Or you can continue west. You got that Billie Eilish song playing. On the one hand, I liked it. On the one hand, I thought it was a little out of place to to end the season on with Bury a Friend, um, which is the name of that song. Because often we do end an episode with some piece of anachronistic music for what this, what should be, what should be in the show. So yes. that the show would be some advanced period from now, slightly. And that Billie Eilish song came out a couple years ago from now so or in the past from now 
our timeline here here okay (laughs) okay i was mixed what did you feel bury a friend is kind of frenemy ish yeah they're not really your friend but they are kind of thing i don't know that's what i was getting out of it the lines are like why do you like me yeah all of it why do you care all that stuff i don't know i thought it was good i thought there was something there the breathing and everything that's in it i didn't see it coming i mean was it a good twist for you to to have serena there well we've said in podcasts past that the best parts of this show are when those two are back on screen. And I think we had said in the last podcast that the show needs to work to bring them together, especially for the, the ending season to give us everything that we need, you know, from these characters to put the best stuff on screen. You got to have these two on screen at the same time. And I still predict Serena to be a complete backstabber at the end of the day. I do. I do not think that Scorpion's not going to sting, but I, I think that they will be friends or frenemies for a long go and help each other to a certain point and then not so much because <laughs> they're, they're just like, you know, it's been clear. We are not friends. We are not friends. You know, we cannot do this. Let's talk since this is the finale about just our season overall. How did you feel about this season? The pacing, all that good stuff, our character development for everybody. I, I'm going to throw in a jaw drop moment. Okay. Okay. The entire funeral scene with Fred and having Hannah up on that Jumbotron and them turn around and look at that Jumbotron and see Hannah with Serena. That was a jaw drop moment. Like I like cheered, fist pumped, told everyone I knew you gotta watch Handmaids this season. It's amazing. That was my that was a big, big season highlight. That's a big moment. Serena giving birth. Big moment. Because, you know. She had to have June as the doula (laughs) or midwife, if you will. I'm just saying words I've heard. I think that this season went by fast. The the show that we got represented just a short period of time, maybe, because it feels like it just went by so fast. Um, Even though there were 10 whole episodes spread out over nine weeks, it still felt like a lot happened in a very short amount of time. Does that make sense? So overall, I was satisfied with the bulk of it and where the where the story got us going by the end although there was some parts toward the middle say especially was like dealing with May Day and stuff like that where it's like I don't think that's going to matter you know that we went and did that Jaden stuff and all that right but it well yes it did you ha- we had to get the the USB drive yeah if we didn't have that we wouldn't have had the next bit of information so so i think they did good on building how we got to where hannah is how we got the information about hannah i think another jaw drop moment for me was watching hannah actually write her name and remembering her name and smiling at it and knowing how to write and remembering who she was because that had been really well built throughout several seasons really about this idea of will she possibly remember them will she possibly know her name's not Agnes and that she had a family before and her name was Hannah and here's all the things that happened like that was that like did a mom's heart good to see that and be like wow thank god she remembers you know like I needed to have some hope that they weren't just gonna get her in the middle of the night and she was just gonna have this like Hi, Magnus, what are you doing? Kind of screaming fit. Like, I feel more hopeful that if that is going to be endgame, which I hope it is for June, then she'll remember her, you know? And and outside of the setting of being in the Mackenzie's house, she'll actually remember. Nick coming around on the bridge and and saying he'll, he'll work with Mark. Huge, like, what the hell? <laughs> like, I didn't see that coming moment this season. I liked getting a little more shading and on... Lawrence's story, you know, where he's coming from, what what he thought he was doing, how he got to where he is now, what he's trying to do now. Is New Bethlehem like completely off the board now? Now that you have all June and Serena and all these people like on trains heading west. I mean, is New Bethlehem like not a thing? Or is this train going to get like grabbed up by Gilead and like resent directly to New Bethlehem? Impossible to say because I mean, I would assume that the train is is in Canadian sovereign territory. So Gilead probably doesn't play into that directly, but you never know. I mean, all of the circumstances by which Serena and June don't reach Alaska could include problems with the with the line. We know that that was an issue on the American side, the rail system east and west 
was highly unreliable because rebels or scavengers or for, I forget the exact term were constantly blowing it up, messing it up. Right. Which I mean, couldn't you see almost like a Western style, like taking over of the train? I would like to hope that even in this future time, even though Canada is apparently now filled with jerks, that they still have a, a country that is run like a normal country. But you never know. You never know. It's, it could be uh, in those more sparsely populated areas of Western Canada. Maybe it is a little more Wild West. I, I just think that there's more of those people like that that drove the pickup truck that are willing to just grab the controls and hit reverse and send it back the other way somehow. I wonder if that's how this is going to go down. Not that Mark Tuello or America wasn't on the yay and, and on the up and up, but that they have to keep control of this train over a long period of time. And there's an awful lot of people who would like to get control of that train. If you're not familiar with where Toronto is, do yourself a favor and pull out a map or look on the, on your phone or on the computer and look how just how far this train has to go to get from Toronto to Vancouver, British Columbia. It's a long I, I just, I do not see them making it there. I just don't. And for a thousand reasons, mm, I'm scared. <laughs> I'm scared, you guys. Season six, I see a train robbery <laughs> coming. Hostages, the whole thing. I could see that happening. I mean, if that's true, then what would make better hostages than babies in this future world? Whoa. Baby hostages. That's bad. That's bad business. Well, <laughs> desperate for babies. Everyone is. Who's your MVP of the season, Paul? Nick. We've seen that he is capable of a lot. He had to blow away Commander Putnam, and he kind of got his loyalties in order uh, between Rose and June and whatever, and he's stepping up to be the guy we wanted him to be. I think in many ways, even though she's she's the girl we love to hate, I think Serena was pretty MVP this this season. I mean, she had to go from playing Waterford's wife at the beginning, you know, to the the widow to like full Gilead resident to being kicked out to being this Canadian ambassador situation to to having to go down to handmaid status being in like detention halls and everything having to run away like think of how much that character did this season I'm giving her a lot of accolades for for a lot of transformation for a lot of movement in her character she had to give birth we we had to see so many things happen she had to go up against the wheelers which was freaking insane she had a lot of screen time, and I think she she carried this season in a lot of ways. I mean, there was a lot of people tuning in to see what the hell Serena was up to and how she was going to get out of this next mess, you know? She's magnetic on screen, and you're right. She did have a lot of ground to cover, and that's what's possibly most the, the most compelling part about her character is trying to figure out her motivations, even guessing what what she might value in and want to do next, knowing that she's on this American refugee train now. When earlier this season, she was like uh, shitting on Americans. She was full Gilead. Full Gilead. I mean, she she wanted to be the queen of Gilead, you know? And then now all of a sudden, she's fleeing amongst the Americans. I mean, this woman has had a lot that went on. Now, my, my secondary choice, and it's a much smaller role just because she had a much smaller role, I think Aunt Lydia... With all of her face acting that you said and everything that she did, she, every time she's on screen, I'm fully on board with whatever Aunt Lydia is doing. I want to see what she's doing. I want to watch her storyline because we know she's going to be in the Testaments and I want to see her transformation. So I'm like watching for every little tiny step that she's taking because I want, I want to have like been like, I see how this happened. You know, I see how she went from here to here. And I think that's why Serena wins my prize for this for this season, because she went from here to here in one season. You know, we had to see her change so much. Now, do I think her heart has changed, Paul? No. Still Scorpion. Still a Scorpion. She still gets you the second you turn your back. But I think she's done a lot, and I think she carried the show quite a bit this season. Now, I love Lawrence, too. He's got a lot of quippy lines. But, oof, that man. Things are falling apart. I don't see him. I don't see him hanging on to any control in season six. He might turn out to be the the big bad that gives us a, a piece of a satisfying ending for this season, right? Is if they off the the architect of Gilead, kind of a bittersweet ending, but 
you can't live down architect of Gilead that much, can you? No. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I don't think that that thing goes away at all. I Do you think season six sees Commander Lawrence on the wall? Hmm, yeah, something like that. Do you think on the wall or is he a fleer? No, no not a fleer. He, he will... He'll go down? He will, yeah, lose... It will just be another commander that loses favor with the other commanders and and is guilty of some such new crime, and that was it. You guys, I have so many more questions. I feel like we could talk about this for hours, but I don't know. I'm not I'm not ready for this season to be done. Like you said, this feels like it went like super fast, but it did have some slow sections where we we're like, okay, like where are we going with this exactly? But man, I think a lot has gone on, and in the last nine and ten, really felt like every everything switched like real fast. Like it was like people kind of like moved their position so quickly, you know, like you were done with them being in Canada as was I, but I didn't expect them to get on trains, you know, and be taken out. Like the things really surprised me how this went. We knew that Serena and June were going to be together, but I didn't see that coming how it went, you know? It's just funny because if you go and listen to our old podcast, you'll hear us probably say that we were so thankful that they were finally in Canada just a moment to catch their breath and all that. And we didn't really see this refugee descent coming. You'll hear us having said both things in the podcast. They were, they were glad to be in Canada. Then all of a sudden we're like, let's get out of Canada. (laughs) It's not that I want to get out of Canada. It was just, we, we seemed like we were in a rut with this whole being in this house with Moira and Luke and June. And it didn't feel like end game, but it like, we weren't really moving forward. Like why were we ever going to leave? Where were we going to go? I didn't see the train thing happening though. I didn't. I didn't see it. Just like in the middle of the night, Mark Twell pulling up in the driveway, like <laughs> get to the train station. Like I didn't see that happening. Good on them for continuously surprising me. That's something that the show has been super consistent with. There's been twists and turns. This one was definitely shot much more like tension filled. The music was very uh, like what's the what's the right word? You know, like in a horror movie, like what is that like? Where it's like, ah, like anticipatory. <laughs> Someone's going to jump out at you all the time. But scary, right? Like I mentioned earlier, the shots were often constructed to build tension. It's 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 often a combination of a slow-paced following a character through like a hall or something. And then the, the music that, that lets you know you're anticipating something to happen once they reach that end point. But you have no idea what it's going to be. Is it Mark Tuello at the end of the bridge? Or is it something... Uh, or is it overhearing that your husband is in deep shit downstairs? Who knows? Well, that covers it for this season of The Handmaid's Tale. We'll be back again for the final season of Handmaid's Tale, probably 2023. This is Caroline. And this is Paul. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts so that other people can find it and enjoy it as well. And if you guys have enjoyed this podcast, please come over to Pod Clubhouse and check out all of the other podcasts that Paula and I do. We have so many going on, you guys lots and lots of picks so please come and check us out paul's currently doing andor there'll be yellowstone going on 1923 we've got your honor coming out so many great things so you can still listen and hang out with us any old time thanks so much for listening thank you for listening this has been an original pod clubhouse production pod clubhouse is a podcast network dedicated to encouraging collaboration among podcasters and friends to bring a fresh voice and diverse perspective on a wide array of content Please visit and leave a comment for us at podclubhouse.com. Rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast feeds on Apple Podcasts. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find us at Pod Clubhouse. Our DMs are always open, and we'd love to hear from you. Pod Clubhouse.